first question that might come up is, well, why talk about carbon pricing? There is no other feasible approach that can provide meaningful reductions in carbon dioxide uh, emissions in the United States. Carbon pricing is the uh, least costly approach. And the reason that it's the least costly approach is that the emission sources are exceptionally numerous. Now, there are two principal approaches to carbon pricing. Uh, one you can think of as a carbon tax, uh, and the other as what has now come to be called cap and trade. A carbon tax is a tax either on CO2 emissions or much more likely and more effective and cheaper, a upstream tax on the carbon content of the three fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Cap and trade takes the opposite approach, but it's completely parallel. And that is that the quantities of CO2 or more, more likely of carbon coming into the economy are constrained by allowances. The allowances are permitted to be traded Importantly, that, that relatively benign mechanism that I talked about in the case of cap and trade is, is not there for building political constituency. And instead, the pressure point tends to be exemptions. The intention of offsets is, is twofold at the surface level. The first point is offsets seek to engage developing nations not willing to take emissions caps. The second key point really focuses on what the benefit is for developed countries. With that in mind, we're going to turn now to look at the experience from the world's largest offset market, which is the Clean Development Mechanism, also known as the CDM, which exists under the Kyoto Protocol. Looking backwards at the offset markets, we see that offsets really haven't been the right policy tool to address the types of credits that are being generated in the market to date. What we found in the power sector is that for all renewable energy in the developing world in the existing offset market, you have state-controlled inputs, which often function in a sort of black box kind of way, determining output at the UN. So the UN's fear is essentially that China is manipulating the power price downwards so that they can continue to reap benefits of international carbon finance and continue to bring in that developed country money to pay for the renewable energy that maybe or maybe not they were going to do anyway. We've designed a system predicated on comparing how a rational agent would act in a market environment. But what we don't have is a market environment, and we have an environment where governments are setting all the inputs in an obscure way. So fundamentally, the type of verification system that the UN has used is incompatible with the reality of markets on the ground. The transportation sector accounts for over 30% of greenhouse gases within the U.S. And insofar as we care about reducing our dependency on foreign oil or, or just our dependency on oil in general, it accounts for over 60% of our uh, use of, of, of oil. If you look at the fact that in 1980, this is actually quite shocking, 20% of the vehicles we bought were trucks in 1980. By 2004, it was over 60%. If we shifted from gasoline to natural gas, we would reduce carbon dioxide emissions by about 25% and then have a lot of other uh, co-benefits um, from other uh, pollutants, criteria pollutants. If you're taxing electricity through a cap and trade system and electricity prices go up because of it, yet you're subsidizing fuels, there's much less of an incentive to switch to these alternative technologies. Dynamic pricing creates what are called megawatt suppliers. In other words, these are price-dependent responses to how much someone consumes. Um, whereas time-of-use pricing, what it does is just simply says you're going to pay more in the middle of the day and you're going to pay less in the off-peak hours of the day. And that's true regardless of what the real-time price is. And so the important thing of dynamic pricing is it says, you see that price now, you want to reduce your consumption in the hour in which system conditions are stressed. A big issue is, is how do you design these dynamic pricing programs? And so one of the things that we've been engaged in here is, is, is working with utilities and the like with the designing experiments to look at these kinds of things. My project is on how our cities, both in the developed and developing world, will adapt to climate change. Mitigation and adaptation are two very different objects. My colleague Jared Diamond at UCLA and his book Collapse, 
where he argues that an unintended consequence of the world achieving the American dream in the absence of carbon pricing. So if 7 billion people each drove 10,000 miles a year, a car that gets 10 miles to the gallon, my arithmetic, and I'd ask Frank to check this, is that would be 7 trillion gallons of gasoline a year if we all achieved the American dream. That's a hell of a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. If a city such as San Diego's quality of life suffers today due to climate change, households can get up and go. We're a highly mobile population. 3% of us switch states every year. Tom Main is a professor of, of architecture, and after the disaster in New Orleans of Hurricane Katrina, he has been working with Brad Pitt on building floatable homes. His vision is that people who live in at-risk communities would be in these floatable homes. This is a prime example of using human capital to offset risk to natural capital.